have discussed earlier today uh, that even simple systems can be complex. And I will talk about the simplest composite system in nature, the hydrogen atom, and how even this system shows remarkable complexity. I have to learn how to... Okay. Uh, hydrogen atoms, when excited, emit light. <coughs> uh, the characteristic visible Balmer spectrum has first been observed in the light from distant stars. And this regular and simple spectrum has inspired many path-breaking discoveries. And really, it was a Rosetta Stone that made it possible to decipher the strange laws of quantum physics. Uh, the Swiss school teacher Balmer was the first to recognize that one can describe the wavelengths of the spectral lines in the spectrum with a simple formula that was later generalized by Rydberg, who introduced his Rydberg constant, but nobody knew why that was so. Uh, Niels Bohr was <coughs> speculating uh, that the hydrogen atom might be a planetary atom where the electron can only be stable in certain stationary orbits and in jumps between these orbits the light is emitted. So this was a totally non-classical picture, but uh, Bohr was able to express the Rydberg constant in terms of the electron mass, the electron charge, Planck's constant, the speed of light. And so this success suggested that there must be something to this crazy idea. The hydrogen atom inspired Louis de Broglie to come up with his concept of meta waves. And finally, Schrodinger, who uh, formulated a wave equation for these meta waves. The Schrodinger quantum mechanics is an extremely successful theory. It allows us to predict very many phenomena that we can observe. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, this, yeah, okay. So, uh, as <coughs> I have no longer control over the sequence of these things, so we. Uh, Anyway, so, so uh, and in particular, so the, the Schrodinger equation described uh, this precision, the Balmer lines. It did not describe a fine structure in the red Balmer alpha, alpha line that was first discovered by Michelson with his interferometer. And uh, Sommerfeld speculated that this fine structure may have something to do with elliptical orbits and uh, uh, relativistic effects. In this context, he introduced the electromagnetic fine structure constant. And then uh, Dirac succeeded in generalizing the Schrodinger equation by introducing relativistic uh, quantum physics and his Dirac equation not only uh, uh, predicted the fine structure, it uh, included the spin of the electron and the existence of anti-electrons. So this seemed to be a very beautiful theory. And people felt that this is so beautiful that it has to be right. However, it turned out that it was not right. It did not predict the fine structure of the Balmer alpha line correctly. The first proof that Dirac was not right was made not by optical spectroscopy, but by radio frequency spectroscopy at the, after the end of the Second World War, when Willis Lamp discovered the lamp shift, the fact that two states in hydrogen that should have the same energy according to Dirac did not have the same energy. The S, the 2S state where the electron comes close to the nucleus and the 2P state where it avoids the nucleus. And Beta was the first to give some uh, intuitive explanation of this lamp shift. He argued 
that in vacuum we have constantly fluctuating electromagnetic fields. These vacuum fluctuations shake the electron, so from the point of view of this shaken electron, the nucleus appears smeared out, and therefore in an S state, uh, the seemingly larger nucleus means less binding force. There is another uh, effect uh, that Beta pointed out that has the opposite sign but is less important, uh, the effect of vacuum polarization. That in a strong field, the vacuum acts as if it was a dielectric because if we have virtual electron-positron pairs. Uh, this was the beginning of the development of quantum electrodynamics prototype of modern quantum field theories. And in 65, Tomonaga, Schwinger, and Feynman received the Nobel Prize for this development. But in the framework of quantum electrodynamics, hydrogen is now complex in the sense that it's very difficult to calculate. Uh, if you want arbitrary precision, it has been calculated to very high, but not to the ultimate precision because it gets extremely difficult. Uh, yeah, after Schrodinger, I wanted to say something regarding the Schrodinger wave function. Uh, even though we have the Schrodinger, Schrodinger quantum mechanics and uh, quantum field theories, the debate continues what really does quantum mechanics describe? And in particular, what does the Schrodinger wave function describe? Does it describe reality? Does it describe what is? Or does it describe belief? Does it describe what can be said? And there's an interesting minimal interpretation called cubism that has been uh, 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 one of whose proponents has been Christopher Fuchs for 10 years or so. And uh, this minimal interpretation has been highlighted by David Merman in the July issue of Physics Today. So in essence, what Fuchs says, that we have not yet learned to describe the real quantum world and a wave function or any other formalism only describes the belief of a physicist about the outcome of a future measurement. If one takes this attitude, many puzzles and paradoxes of quantum physics go away, such as the collapse of the wave function, spooky action at the distance, and one could go on. So I think it's certainly an interesting point of view to look at. And I think at the heart of this view is the statement that properties determined by a quantum measurement do not exist before the measurement. So quantum measurements are moments of creation. Uh, and uh, the Schrodinger equation is self-consistent and self-contained, but it cannot describe the real quantum world. So how do we make progress? How do we break out of this uh, model of our belief? And of course the answer can in the end maybe come from experiments that show the limits of our quantum theory. Uh, so uh, you can go to higher and higher energies uh, as people do at CERN, or one can try to go to higher and higher precision to find limits to our understanding of quantum physics, and, and this has been our approach for the last 40 years or so. The means to go to higher precision arrived with the invention of the laser more than 50 years ago. Uh, the race to build the first laser was triggered by Archolo and Ch Charlie Towns with a seminal paper on infrared and optical lasers. And I had the good fortune to join Art Schaller as a postdoc in 1970. And one of the early things I did there was to use a laser, a tunable dye laser, to look at the red Balmer alpha line of hydrogen, but now with saturation spectroscopy, a nonlinear technique of spectroscopy that became possible only with laser light that makes it possible to suppress the Doppler broadening to the, due to the rapid thermal motion. And so it was a simple tabletop experiment, took a few weeks to set up, 
but for the first time could we see individual fine structure components and we could see in particular the lamp shift directly resolved in the optical spectrum. And so this was the beginning of a long quest for ever higher resolution and measurement accuracy with the thought that maybe if we look closely enough one day we will find again a surprise that might lead to another conceptual breakthrough. So this has been pushed now so that we can make spectroscopy in hydrogen to 15 digits of decimal precision. Have you found a surprise yet? Maybe. I will talk about that in the end. The techniques that have made it possible to do this type of spectroscopy also make it possible now to build incredibly precise optical atomic clocks. One of this year's Nobel Prize winner, David Weinland and his co-workers have built a clock that reaches 10 to the minus 18 territory in precision using the same techniques that we use for hydrogen spectroscopy. There is a particularly sharp resonance in hydrogen that uh, we have spent a great deal of time on, a two-photon resonance from the ground state to the metastable 2S state that you can excite with ultraviolet light. The natural line width should only be about one hertz, whereas the optical frequency is on the order of 10 to the 15 hertz. You can suppress Doppler broadening, at least to first order. No, it doesn't want to move. It's okay, it's something is stuck. Okay. Uh, uh, by exciting these atoms with two counter propagating beams. Uh, here is an, a setup that pretty much sketches what we are still doing. We prepare cold hydrogen atoms by letting them collide with a cold nozzle at the bottom of a helium cryostat. This cold atomic beam is propagating in a standing optical field be maintained between two mirrors of ultraviolet light. And if atoms get excited, uh, we can apply a quenching field that uh, forces them to emit Lyman alpha photons. And in this way, we can observe a resonance that is not yet one hertz wide, the natural width, but it's very sharp. If, if you would stretch the visible Balmer spectrum to fit on that same scale, you could wrap it around the equator, and not only once, but about 20,000 times at that scale. And to do justice to such a sharp resonance, again, there is some problem with this. Yeah, I just want to advance to the next slide. Okay. So am I doing something wrong? Or? Okay. Uh, so how do you adjust this to such a sharp resonance? And there Art Schorlo had good advice. He argued if you want to do spectroscopy with the highest precision, you should measure the frequency of light rather than the wavelengths, in, as people have always done in classical spectroscopy. And uh, so we followed that advice through 10 years of enormous labor we, in the end, succeeded in measuring this frequency. Uh, this was published at the end of the last millennium. Uh, <coughs> we, from this frequency, could determine a new value for the Rydberg constant, one of the fundamental constants. We could determine the lamp shift of the ground state of hydrogen, so another test of quantum electrodynamics. And if you believe in the theory of quantum electrodynamics, we could determine the charge radius of the proton and also of the deuteron. And these radii were more precise than what people had been able to measure with large uh, accelerator experiments. And uh, of course, these 10 years of work, in a way, were wasted because if you had simply waited till a new tool arrived, the frequency comb, we could have done these measurements uh, in a few weeks. Uh, so, uh, there is some difficulty. Uh, 
Okay, now it has. Yeah, so I don't know what, what I'm doing wrong here. But <laughs> it, it goes with delay. Okay. Yeah, so this tool, uh, this simple tool that makes ultra precise measurements now easy, is called the laser frequency comb. And uh, maybe I will. <laughs> okay. I will do. Use the finger. Use the finger. Maybe the finger. finger. Uh, uh, I had some animations that uh, were meant to illustrate how a frequency comb works, but since the projection system makes it not possible to show these animations, I will try to go through here. So it's at the heart of it is a femtosecond laser which is nothing new in itself. It's a, in, the, in the most elementary form, an optical cavity consisting of two mirrors. And we have a flash of light bouncing back and forth as in Einstein's Gedanken light clock, except it's a laser, so we have an amplifying medium and we can couple out a train of femtosecond pulses. These lasers have been in use in hundreds of laboratories as flashlights to study ultrafast phenomena. The people interested in precision spectroscopy uh, mostly worked with a different kind of laser, with a single mode laser. You also have a cavity, two mirrors, but there is only one st single standing wave oscillating and out comes a pure tone, so to speak, a sinusoidal wave. In practice, it's not so, si not so easy to make a laser go in only one mode. Uh, it's more likely that it will go in two modes, two frequencies, two different wavelengths. And now you look at the superposition, and again, the animation, of course, doesn't work. But if you look at the superposition, you get a beat note, like the beat note between two tuning forks, and there is a train of elongated wave packets being emitted, and the energy in the cavity sloshes back and forth. If you have three modes, Okay, yeah, so leave, leave it here, maybe it's good. If you have three modes or five modes, you can make short pulses of light separated by an amazingly long period of dark. So all the modes are on all the time, but they cancel each other through mutual interference during the dark period. And so there are two, these are two different ways to look at the mode lock laser. Either in the time domain, you have a flash of light bouncing back and forth and a train of pulses being emitted, or in the frequency domain, you have a comb of very precisely equally spaced modes that interfere so as to produce these short pulses. The very precise spacing is ensured by some nonlinear process of self-organization and it has been verified to 20 decimal digits. Okay, this is frustrating. Okay. It's good to be that the battery is low. <laughs> no. 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 I, I, I had prepared an animation of a mechanical frequency comb that showed that even such a simple mechanical system can appear amazingly complex, but we cannot see it. So I just want to advance to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go on to the next. Okay. I wish I knew what to do. Uh, so uh, so, so uh, these are very simple principles. Still, most experts were surprised by how far these principles could be pushed, that you could take deep red light pulses from a commercial titanium sapphire laser, launch them in a special microfabricated silica fiber, uh, which has a small solid core surrounded by air-filled holes. You can guide such a high intensity that the refractive index is changed by the pulse, and uh, as a result, the spectrum is broadened. This is a complex process. Uh, with uh, which is still not fully understood, but it's repeatable enough that
that if you look at the output, at this rainbow of colors of the white light that emerges, it's not an ordinary rainbow. It is, and again, let me, I wish I knew what to do. <laughs> Okay, so it, it, it's a frequency comb. Uh, uh, the early frequency comb that he built is now an antique. It's on display in the Deutsche Museum in Munich. Uh, Uh, maybe, maybe you do. Uh, one can even buy a frequency comb from a small startup, startup company. Let's go on. Uh, and so what you get is now a million comb lines, precisely, evenly spaced, spaced by precisely the repetition frequency of the laser that one can measure in terms of an atomic clock. Uh, the mode locking mechanism doesn't guarantee that successive pulses have the same phase of the carrier wave relative to the envelope. And as a result, there is a global shift of this comb by some unknown carrier envelope offset frequency. But if you have an octave spanning comb, it's easy to measure this global shift also as a radio frequency beat note, and then you can determine the absolute frequency of each and every comb line in terms of an atomic clock. Or you can go the other way. You can have a sharp spectral line, like our hydrogen resonance. You server control the comb so that one of the comb lines is locked to this optical pendulum. And then the repetition f uh, rate becomes a known integer fraction of this optical frequency. So let's go on. So how do you use a frequency comb to measure the frequency of hydrogen. At the time of the Nobel Prize in 2005, there was a poster printed that illustrates that. So you have a laser, a tunable laser. You send some of this light to the hydrogen atoms to see if they get excited. And if so, you send another part to the frequency comb, and you look at a radio frequency beat node between this laser frequency and the nearest comb line, and that tells you precisely where is the hydrogen resonance? Uh, in reality, it looks slightly more complicated. This is a view into the laboratory. Let's go on. <laughs> uh, as a reference, we have been uh, using a transportable cesium atomic clock, a fountain clock built in Paris at the Observatoire. So this is a look of this clock. And let's go on. And here is our most recent team, Christian Pata, a graduate student, and three senior scientists, Arthur Matveyev, Nikolai Kolachevsky, and Yanis Alnes, and go on. And they have measured this frequency now to a relative uncertainty of 4.2 times 10 to the minus 15. I, I'm fairly confident that this can be improved another 10 or 100 fold. And so why, why do we want to know it so well? Let's go on. Uh, so uh, of course one uh, intriguing possibility would be to redefine the unit of time in terms of the simplest of the atoms, a hydrogen clock. Uh, if you can make measurements to that precision, you can ask if fundamental constants are constant or are maybe slowly changing with time. Uh, there is still the question of symmetry between matter and antimatter. I think it's now within reach uh, within the next few years to do similar spectroscopic experiments with anti-hydrogen. And uh, of course, if one wants to detect a, a difference, one has to probably measure with very high precision. Uh, there is one area where this high precision doesn't help so much at the moment, and that is if you want to measure fundamental constants. If you look uh, at the 
constant, it's the present value of the Rydberg constant, it's only known to 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 12. And the reason is that uh, in order to derive this constant from the measured frequency, we need to know a correction due to the finite size of the proton. And the charge radius of the proton simply is not so well known. And of course, the proton is also a very complex system. Uh, three quarks held together with gluons, and quantum chromodynamics tries to give a description, but it's not able to predict the charge radius. Uh, therefore, uh, we were all very excited when in the summer of 2009, an experiment finally gave some results that we had pushed for about 10 years. And experiment to look at the lamp shift, not of ordinary hydrogen, but of hydrogen, of neonic hydrogen, where the electron is replaced by a 200 times heavier neon. Uh, the, the lamp shift is in the infrared region of the spectrum, and it's a very challenging, difficult experiment. It's c carried out by an international collaboration that has grown to more than 30 scientists from 12 different institutions uh, led by Randolph Pohl from our laboratory in Garching. And the result was unexpected. Uh, there were predictions where the lamp shift should occur if we believe in the electron-proton scattering experiments at accelerators and the proton size, or if you believe in the official proton size value from the uh, official adjustment of the fundamental constants and the real resonance was outside. Let's go on. And so we, we now have a value that is considerably more accurate than before, but outside the expected region. Uh, so if we translate that to a charge radius of the proton, let's go on. Uh, yeah, we have a radius that is almost 4% smaller than previously assumed. We can use this new radius to derive a new value of the Rydberg constant. Let's go on. Uh, and again, uh, it's more accurate than previously known, but outside the error limits. So these new values have not been included in the latest adjustment of the fundamental constants. Uh, the shrunk proton radius has attracted the attention of journalists. And uh, yeah, let's go on. Uh, in 2010, this experiment was ranked among the top 10 physics breakthroughs by Physics World as number nine. Also in La Recherche, there it was number seven. But uh, we still don't know what is the problem. We can, let's go on. Uh, we can, yeah, no, let's look. Yeah. Uh, uh, we can look at a prediction in Scientific American in a comment. Whatever the answer, physicists will, will most likely have plenty to keep scratching their heads about for years to come. So this is where we are now. And it could be that we have detected a kink in the armor of quantum electrodynamics. It could also be that there is simply a mistake that we have overlooked. Of course, people have now had more than a year time to check at all, was to check for possible mistakes. So far, we haven't found any mistake. And it shows that even the simple hydrogen atom has amazingly rich questions and maybe uh, even the key to future advances of our understanding. So thank you.